Good evening, everyone. Apologies for the technical difficulties tonight, but thank you for those of you who are with us. This is our sixth episode of Punishment and Profit, an educational webinar series about the prison industry presented by Worth Rises and The Green Space. I'm Bianca Tylek, founder and executive director at Worth Rises, a nonprofit organization that works to dismantle the prison industry and end the exploitation of those it touches. Today, we're talking about data and information systems in the prison industry, the increasingly dystopian technologies that the criminal legal and immigration systems have put in place to monitor the people and communities they ensnare. Before we get into tonight's program, we'll learn five fast facts about the data and information systems in the prison industry to ground us. Have you ever thought about how your data is shared with law enforcement and what it might say about you? My name is Bianca Tylek, I'm the Executive Director at Worth Rises, and here are five facts you should know about data and information in the prison industry. Courts use corporate algorithms that are shielded from public scrutiny as trade secrets to determine if someone should be released while awaiting trial. These tools are based on information like where you live, and as a result, Black folks are twice as likely as white folks to be labeled high risk at bail hearings and not re-offend. Biometric data analysis has similar issues. Facial recognition tools, for example, identify white men correctly 99% of the time as compared to 65% for women with darker skin. Nevertheless, with corporate support, law enforcement has stored 170 million faces, and the Department of Homeland Security is expected to store 259 million identities by 2022. And the market is still expanding. Prison telecom corporations have recently collected more than 200,000 incarcerated voice prints that they're packaging for sale. Learn more with the curriculum at worthrises.org. A little later in the show, we'll be talking to Bernard Harcourt, Debbie Nathan, and Baromita Shaw. Uh, unfortunately, we were hoping to start today uh, speaking off with Taylon Murphy Sr., but unfortunately an urgent matter has come up and he'll be unable to join us. He wanted to share the story of his late daughter, Tayshana Chicken, who was killed by gun violence in September of 2011 and his fight against the gang raids and gang databases that her death was used to justify. But this, after, this evening, we are blessed to be joined with another incredible advocate who has stepped into his place to help us understand gang databases. Josmar Trio is a writer and organizer based in New York City. He's joined with us and his dog, Mingus. Um, he organizes with the Policing and Social Justice Project at Brooklyn College. Uh, Josmar, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, how are you? Thanks for having me. I want to start us off today by reminding our audience that victims are a critical piece of our directly impacted community and must be part of our abolition journey. Taylon's story presents one of those reasons. The New York Police Department used his daughter to justify the raids of the New York City public housing uh, departments here in New York City, we, which are also facilitated by many gang databases, and though his family strongly opposed them. The reality was that neither gang raids nor gang databases would have saved his daughter, Tayshana. Can you explain what a gang database is, Joe Smyer, and who ends up on them? Sure. So, uh, so gang databases, uh, of which we have one here in New York City, but uh, they're really all across the country. Federal government uh, uses gang databases as well. Uh, it's just kind of like a secret list, a way for law enforcement to catalog uh, and then surveil and track people that they themselves deem to be gang members. Um, they're really kind of unaccountable secret lists uh, that there are very few ways to find out if you're on. Um, and they also usually lead to um, uh, gang takedowns or arrests for gang conspiracy, some of the most complex criminal charges that we have in our criminal legal system. Uh, so being on a gang database is oftentimes a precursor to a very complicated form of prosecution. Uh, and then unfortunately, many, many years of incarceration afterwards. And can you share, uh, Joe Smart, how somebody ends up on a gang database? Sure. So uh, different places have different criteria or processes by which uh, they include people. Uh, most law enforcement are very secretive on this process. Uh, in New York City, we've been able to force the police department to disclose at least some um, through uh, some uh, city council hearings and through uh, 
Freedom of Information Requests uh, by Professor Babe Howell out of CUNY Law School. Uh, New York City, some of the criteria for being on the gang database include uh, the neighborhood you live in. Uh, New York City classifies uh, most, if not all, of public housing as uh, quote unquote gang territory. So just living in public housing is one piece of the criteria to, that can land you on a gang database. Others are associating with known gang members. And because known gang members uh, is again, kind of the, uh, in just something that the police can arbitrarily put on you, uh, it really just creates kind of like this snowball effect where if you know a person who's gang, who they deem gang member, uh, that you can be associated and then anyone who knows you. And so it kind of like uh, spirals out from that from that point. Other things are uh, wearing certain colors. Uh, New York City Police Department, I think, has most of the colors under the rainbow as uh, gang colors. So red, blue, purple, black, white, yellow, uh, you name it. And it's a high likelihood that that's a gang color, according to the New York City Police Department. Um, other ones include um, uh, you know, scars, tattoos, uh, but they're sort of vague and they kind of allow this kind of like this broad way of uh, police, you know, tagging you as a gang member. Um, but the most troubling ones are who you know and where you live. I think that in particular, right, the piece you just said, which is that knowing somebody who's already on the gang database can put your, you on the gang database and it's really just that simple. Uh, and I think for probably unsurprising reasons then, right? Uh, 95, 98% of people who are on gang databases in New York City alone are black and brown folks. And that persists across the country in many different ways. So uh, gang databases are not just something though that is used in policing. They're also used in prisons and jails uh, for sort of similar in similar ways, right? So prisons and jails put people on gang databases um, to put people in maximum security facilities, to put people in solitary confinement, or to even deny them access to programs. Uh, in all of their instances, as you said, these are secretive lists that, are, that create unjust and unequal power structures. How are these databases actually counterproductive to public safety? So gang databases don't make anyone safer. They don't make any neighborhood safer. Having a group of people on a secret list uh, does not save a life, does not stop uh, violence in any way. Gang databases create the impetus for the police to hyper criminalize and hyper surveil and hyper police uh, a group of people even more so than they do to the rest of, uh, of people who live in communities of color. Um, what they do is they create a lot of harassment. They create a target on the back of the people who are deemed gang, uh, who are um, gang databases. Um, they usually uh, feed people back into the into the criminal justice, criminal legal system. Um, where if they were not gang involved to begin with, they go into prisons and jails where they're actually uh, more likely to come out more violent, more prone to violence, and uh, ironically, more gang involved uh, if they were gang involved to begin with. Uh, and so if you wanted to, if you wanted to figure out the last thing you'd want to do to stop violence, whether from gangs or not, you would do with what this approach is, which is criminalize people, put people away in prison where they're likely to come out uh, much worse afterwards. Um, and then oftentimes people, when they come out, uh, they are excluded from public housing or have barriers to employment because of that gang status, because of the types of charges that they face with the gang label. Uh, and so you put them in a, basically you put them on in a position to, 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 uh, to fail again, and in and, and many cases without housing. So uh, it creates, I think, a co constant loop back of violence, constant loop back of, um, you know, trauma for the community um, and so it's, uh, you know, it's probably the most counterproductive thing that you can do. Joe Smart, thank you so much for your work and thank you so much for joining us last minute. We're super grateful um, and also understand that you have to hop off. So thank you um, and we'll talk soon. Great, thanks for having me guys. A quick reminder that if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, please feel free to use the chat function to pose questions to any of our guests. You can also post questions on Twitter using the hashtag punishment profit. Our next guest is Bernard Harcourt. Welcome, Bernard. Bernard is the professor of law and professor of political science at Columbia University. Bernard started his legal career representing people on death row at the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama, and continues to represent people sentenced to life and sentenced to death, excuse me, and life imprisonment without parole. 
and people at Guantanamo. Bernard, thank you again so much for joining us. Thanks, Bianca. It's really an honor to be here and to follow Josmar Trujillo. Um, so Bernard, let's talk, let's, let's shift gears a little bit and we're gonna talk about risk assessment tools, a, a different type of, of data system. Risk assessments are used to help courts do everything from decide who should be released pre-trial to what programs a pr person gets while they're in prison. However, these tools have two critical issues. They neither measure what they claim to and are remarkably racially biased. Can you explain? Sure, yeah. And let me start with the, the issue of race because race and racism are just baked into these algorithms. And I mean, it's fair to say really that kind of risk prediction, risk, the very notion of risk today is pretty much a proxy for race. And to understand that, you, basically you need to kind of go back in history a little bit and understand that, you know, at, at the origin, these algorithms actually included race and ethnicity. Uh, in them. There's a long history to these algorithms that goes back to the 1920s when sociologists started making them, particularly in the parole prediction uh, area, so predicting who would violate parole. Uh, one of the most famous ones, the Burgess model, you know, it had uh, black in it, it had race in it. If, 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 you, if you were African American, you got actually in some of these, you got a black mark, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. So being American colored was a black mark and being American white was a white mark and they would take race into account. They would also take ethnicity. So in Burgess's model, for instance, if you were Italian, Polish or Lithuanian, that was a positive uh, sign. If you were Irish, British or German, that was a negative sign. But race was included for a long time, all the way into the 1970s. Uh, and so, for instance, in California, uh, in 1974, still, uh, there was a, you know, they, would, they had a base expectancy score for parole, four factors. Uh, one of them was race, uh, the other was prior commitments, uh, offense type, number of escapes, but race was in there. Of course, at some point, race couldn't be uh, used anymore for, you know, civil rights reasons. And basically what happens is that most of these just pivot to prior criminal history as the predictor uh, of, uh, of crime or dangerousness or violence or whatever it is. And of course, given racial profiling, given racist policing in this country, what you get basically is a system where kind of like we're focusing on prior criminal history as a proxy for race, really, because it's loaded with race. And, and the result uh, is that these are all skewed uh, along race lines. So that's one problem. The other big problem that you mentioned, and it's totally right, is that really these, these, uh, these risk prediction tools aren't predicting uh, what we think they're predicting. So the idea here is that, you know, we could predict we predict crime or we predict likelihood of not uh, coming to trial if it's a pre-detention bail issue or, you know, whatever. But the only thing you're not predicting those uh, those those acts, what you're actually predicting is uh, the likelihood of being policed in effect, um, because the key factor becomes a prior criminal contact. And so what's going in is who got arrested, you know, who got detained. Uh, and that depends on policing. And so it's not really just a problem of garbage in, garbage out, which we often have when we deal with data. It doesn't, it's not just that the data is tainted somewhat. It's that we're, we're looking at the wrong data completely. It's, it's, if you want to predict crime, it's something completely different than if what you're predicting is the likelihood that the police are going to detain you, right? Because the policing itself has a tilt. Uh, and we know it, like 85% of stop and frisk were of African-American and uh, Hispanic uh, New Yorkers, right? So once you've got that in there, you're predicting something completely different. It's kind of like you're predicting the stop and frisk. Well, we know what the prediction showed there, right? Absolutely. I was, I was thinking of stop and frisk when you were talking 100%, right? We knew what communities police were located in. And so the likelihood that you had contact with the police was in, in large part based on that community and, um, and because the segregated nature of our community is based on race. So Bernard, can you tell us more about these algorithms and how corporations are now working to protect these algorithms from public scrutiny by claiming that they're proprietary trade secrets? 
uh, I think it's important for people to know that many of these uh, algorithms, these risk assessment tools are actually being developed by the private sector. It seems absolutely unbelievable to me that these corporate algorithms uh, determine whether or not our neighbors um, should be caged uh, or what programs they get in prisons, but they won't disclose how those decisions are made. The algorithms are not actually available. So can you help us understand how that can be the case and what power we're giving to these corporations? Yeah, right. I mean, that's one of the most puzzling and heinous dimensions of all this, really. It's a business, right? It's a profitable business. Uh, there's a lot of money to be made in the risk assessment business um, because they're used everywhere in prisons and, and in courts and uh, from the pretrial detention to the sentencing and, and, to the, and to placements in prison and every through every aspect they've become kind of uh, we see them everywhere and so as a result you know of everyone adopting them this is big business and the business model really uh, works on proprietary interests and proprietary trade secrets so the makers claim the trade secret and they claim that it would hurt their competitive advantage if they had to share it All right and so the model it's you know it's a it's a free it's the free enterprise model at its worst uh, meaning that we're giving private corporations the ability to decide who to incarcerate or detain pre-trial without real public scrutiny. Um, the two major risk tools that are used right now, you know, the, L, the level of services inventory revised and compass were developed by private corporations. Um, and the courts then rely on those tools that are, that have undisclosed information, right? Cause it's, it's private, uh, it's the private formula in there. Um, it's not turned over to defense counsel, which means that ultimately the person, a person can be, you know, punished on the basis of information that they can't even contest, that they don't even know. Um, and, and the courts are basically meeting out state sanctioned punishment on the basis of information that many of the that, 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 that no one really has seen what's in the, you know, what's in the Coca-Cola formula there. And one, it's hard to imagine a greater due process violation for an individual uh, than to imagine them being sentenced um, as a result of information that they can't contest, that they can't challenge, that they don't even know what's in there. Now, of course, the result is this kind of ratcheting effect because if race is baked in and we're selecting on race, essentially, then you have a ratchet effect with more and more uh, disproportionality in uh, punishment in prison populations. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like, you know, the business model that you're talking about, it's expanding nature. I mean, these things are in large part you. And I think the dangerous part, right, is that many of the reforms, quote unquote, that um, people are seeking that, you know, we say we have bipartisan support for things like abolishing uh, cash bail are often now being replaced with this notion of risk assessments and that there's these corporations that are actually fighting and lobbying for those particular um, uh, things to, to essentially replace the bail industry and things of that sort. And so um, it's, it's wildly um, concerning. And despite all these critical concerns, the use of risk assessments some, uh, explaining is sort of rapidly expanding. Um, and it's, you know, being labeled uh, criminal justice reform, quote unquote. And so as we are moving in these campaigns to abolish cash bail, uh, and we're instead implementing risk assessment tools, I guess the question is like that for you is just what do we do? Right. Um, what's the answer? Right. Yeah. I mean, you're touching on the most difficult question, particularly in the algorithm context, because the present alternatives are, are terrible, uh, you know, and so the, the, the present what exists right now isn't any better, right? You've got cash bill that obviously, I mean, you know, it doesn't take a rocket science test to understand that cash bill is going to discriminate against the poor and the disadvantage, disadvantage and, and that there are obviously in this country huge race correlations and ethnic correlations with, with, with poverty and disadvantage. So cash bail is inherently discriminatory. Uh, leaving it to the judge's discretion is also really problematic today because of both explicit and implicit bias. 
We've all been attuned to implicit bias. So even if it's not a, a judge who is explicitly uh, a racist, we know that there are going to be biases there. So, so the, the problem is, you know, people feel as if, well, there isn't any alternative and they turn to these algorithms thinking that they're a solution, that they're kind of a messiah. And the only reason is because they seem neutral or it's got numbers or it's, you know, it's so complicated. We don't understand it. We leave it to the scientists. We leave it to the you know, the people who are experts, but the, but the problem is that they produce even more discrimination because of that ratchet effect, because they're selecting on race through uh, prior criminality and that that ratchets it up. So you even get more and more discrimination in the process of turning to these tools. And we've seen it, whether it was in deinstitutionalization of mental hospitals or in in all of these contexts, when we turn to algorithms, we see a darker, more African-American and Latinx population being detained. So they produce even more discrimination. So it's clearly it's time that we look elsewhere than in kind of criminal legal solutions. We have to find alternatives. I mean, we have to explore what W.E.B. Du Bois, Angela Davis and others today are, are, are talking about, which is abolition democracy, right? New and different institutions for community health and well-being. Fernand, thank you so much for your time. We'll see you at the end of the show. Um, to learn more about Bernard's work, follow him on Twitter at Bernard Harcourt and follow the Initiative for a Just Society at Columbia CCCT. That's four C's and a T. Next, I wanna bring in Debbie Nathan. Debbie, is a longtime independent journalist who writes about moral panics in criminal justice, immigration policy, and mental health theory and practice. She has written extensively for the appeal about immigration and incarceration, including a series of articles with last week's guest, George Joseph, about the use of voice print technology in prisons and jails. Welcome, Debbie. Thank you. So Debbie, let's again shift gears uh, and talk about voice printing. Um, love for you to help us understand this new voice printing practice in prisons and jails. We know it's new and it's quickly spreading and many prisons and jails incarcerated people are now being required to provide a voice print in order to use the phone. How does this technology work and has it even been tested? Yeah, well, let me explain first what a voice print is. It's um, a unique digitized vocal signature. It's based on your pitch and your intonation and other parameters, audio parameters in your voice. And um, so what, what it does is it creates an algorithm that allows authorities to do voice recognition on phone calls. And the way that those are made, those algorithms are created is that people are made to read rote phrases into the phone. Um, and then they're digitized into the voice print. So my co-author, George and I, I interviewed currently and formerly incarcerated people who described reading these rote phrases and kind of not really knowing what they were doing. Oftentimes on the wall by the phone, there's like this list of words that they're told or phrases they're told to read. And they're, they're very strange. People are sort of weirded out by them. Um, there are things like the fox ran up the hill, or the lady brought the pail to the lake. Um, and actually, I mean, they know they're reading them. They don't know why often, but often they're covert as well. These voice prints are made covertly so that all the person is doing is saying their name every time they make a phone call. And then that becomes the algorithm, the voice print. Um, so, you know, people, even when they know that they're doing it, I wouldn't say that they have that they're given consent. They're actually told um, you can't you can't use the phone or you can't you know talk to anyone uh, unless you do this. And so again, of course, you know some people don't even know they're doing it. But but for people who do know that they're make they're producing some kind of biometric, they want so desperately generally to talk with loved ones and families that they just consent, you know, and it's just not consent. Um, it's just by definition coercive. It's not the only digital thing that's being done by prison and jail phone companies to surveil incarcerated people. Um, Securus, which is the biggest phone, a private prison and jail phone company offers a service that um, provides what they call 
behavioral analysis of video chats, which is another new technology that people enjoy using. It's very expensive, but um, so behavioral analysis of video chats, detecting what Securus calls, quotes, suspicious or suggestive keywords or phrases. And another company talks about some of those keywords being COVID, for example, or the word cough. And they boast that they even have Spanish language keywords. They talk about um, creating regional word lists, keyword lists for things like weapons. They say they speak inmate as though that's a language. Um, so Securus is the biggest provider of voice printing for jails and prisons. They're located in Dallas in that area. Um, and there's no publicly available record of how many people Securus and other companies, like you might have heard of some GTL, for example, um, how many people they've enrolled in these voice print databases. Um, George and I found them randomly. We just sort of were, we looked on Google because there are a lot of contracts, county jail contracts and state prison contracts for um, these services. So we had a very random sample. We found voice printing in 11 states. Um, we verified the facilities that we found and we came up with 200,000 incarcerated people subject to this technology. And again, very random, a very, very small sample, I'm sure. No doubt it was a gross overcount, uh, excuse me, undercount. Um, we do know that Securus says that it's monitoring right now um, 38 million offender calls, or that it has monitored in the, during the time it's existed, 38 million calls. And um, it currently contracts with over 3,000 uh, law enforcement agencies that deal with over 3 million incarcerated people in North America. Wow. There's a lot of things in there that um, are deeply disturbing, right? I think um, when you talk about things like a company saying that it speaks inmate, quote unquote, um, as you said, as if that's a language, um, what exactly that means or what it's suggesting. Um, the notion of behavioral analysis of people on video, like. How has that been tested? What, you know, where is this behavioral analysis skill set coming from? Um, it's, it's really disturbing. And, and one of the most disturbing things I'll say that I learned about voice printing technology in these prisons and jails was that it wasn't just capturing the voices of folks who are incarcerated. Uh, these data print, uh, these data and voice print uh, Technology also harvests the voices of folks on the outside that are communicating with incarcerated people. And in fact, if you are in touch with more than one person in the same facility, your voice can be flagged. I am already in, sort of in my mind thinking of all the ways that that um, is causing harm, but can you explain the implications of, of that type of data? Yeah, um, you know, Secura says that it doesn't even go after your name if you're an outside person, if you get a call, you know, you're on the outside of the facility and you get a call. But if you were formerly incarcerated and had a voice print made from jail or from prison, then they do record your name. So it's not, I, I believe that they actually record, they obviously record everyone in a conversation. Um, and so, you know, if you are speaking with two um, incarcerated people, multiple people, I mean, certainly like I have as a reporter, you know, I've speaking with, spoken with many incarcerated people in both detention centers, uh, immigration detention centers, and in jails and prisons. So um, I myself, you know, have to wonder whether I have been put on these lists. And um, I remember a time, you know, when calls were surveilled just by guards listening in. And people, I think there was a culture where incarcerated people were aware of that, but they weren't too worried about it because after all, many, many hundreds, if not thousands of calls can be made from a facility every day. But, you know, because of these new technologies, my sense as a reporter when I'm speaking with people, um, and it's very palpable in immigration detention centers, where people are actually trying to organize as they are in jails, right? Trying to organize against things like um, negligent COVID health um, procedures. And um, they're terrified. They're really afraid that they're being surveilled. 
and they may be. I mean, I've wondered whether when people are talking about COVID, not because they're sick, but because they're organizing a COVID protest, or whether they're saying huelga de hambre in Spanish, or whether they're saying la COVID, right? You know, because they say that they've got Spanish lists of, of words. This is very frightening to people, and they've communicated this to people. Um, I, you know, I think that like the fear of this and just the existence of these technologies are just a real threat to people's very deep need to have relationships with their loved ones and their need to do to be civic people to do organizing if that's what they want to do um, in these facilities. Um, they are a threat to incarcerated people's advocates and to people like me, like uh, journalists who want to bring their stories to the public. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, something that I've noticed, as I said, a sense in these facilities that um, pe people know they're being surveilled in new ways, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think like, I think definitely the advocacy thing, I can tell you how many people in one facility, right? Um, I or any of my staff works and like, I can only imagine us being flagged, right? It also feels, and we're going to get into this with our next guest around um, the surveillance of protests, the surveillance of um, of those of us who are doing work against the system, but it, you know, you can see that. You could also see potentially like voice printing and people being afraid to get on the phone who might be undocumented, even if they're home, um, because of you know what their voice might tell about where they are um, and all of that. And so, you know, deeply troubling. And so, in this last just uh, minute or so that we have here, I'm going to jump jump into the business model, right? Um, so we know that. Uh, all of this, as we are constantly talking about every week, is a business. And there is, you know, in the telecom space, uh, we know that surveillance is often used as the excuse to increase the cost of communication. Uh, you know, very typically when we talk about these dollar a minute calls, uh, we often hear that, you know, it's the surveillance um, that uh, people are paying for. And so what it does is it shift the, shifts the cost of operating a prison and jail onto families, but it's not actually the call that costs that. It is the surveillance that is inherent to a prison or jail, not to communication. But beyond that, your reporting uncovered an even more sinister plan behind the voice printing technology that corporations developed um, and is now being, you know, it seems like tested in prisons and jails. And can you tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting when you look at patents. Um, you go to the U.S. Patent Office online and you look at patents from companies like Securus as well as other companies, and you can see whether you know you can see what they've invented. So clearly, they're it's on their minds, and they may be past the R and D and actually being putting it in practice. But they're the GTL company, which is Global Tel Network, for example, they have what they call a national voice database patent. And it would record um, everyone in the US who has a phone account. And then they advertise it as something that as a system that authorities could use to quote track wanted criminals. So the patent talks about somebody phoning in like a delivery order for a pizza to a pizzeria. And then their voice is recognized in the national database. And then the police call up the pizzeria and they get the address by saying that they're, you know, want to inquire about the order, like where did the order go to? And, um, you know, the implication is that this private um, prison and jail voice printing company could make voice prints of every single person in the United States who has a phone, and then sell that database to any law enforcement agency that wants to use it. And, you know, it really seems like when you look at this technology and you look at the way that the companies are imagining it, that they're testing out voice print and keyword technology on people in jails and prisons, because those people are thought of as not deserving Fourth Amendment rights to privacy. Um, one of the advocates who we interviewed said, today it's that population, but tomorrow it's another population. Yes, uh, I mean, I think that's so powerful. The reality is that as we encroach on the privacy um, rights of certain populations, it will naturally hit us all at some point. Um, and just the notion that a company like GTL, which is specifically a prison telecom corporation, has a patent that is meant to reach all of us uh, is obviously very concerning. And it's also not that far from possible, right? Uh, Forward.us had a report that said one in two 
uh, people in the U.S. Uh, has been touched by incarceration. And so you could see that actually through those phone calls, simple enough, they could potentially one day um, manage to voice print all of us. Debbie, thank you so much. Uh, to follow Debbie's work, visit her author page at theintercept.com. We'd like to remind everyone that you can share questions in the chat on YouTube or Facebook, or by using the hashtag Punishment Profit on Twitter. We'll be taking your questions at the end of the program. Uh, our final guest today is Paromita Shah. Paromita is the executive director of Just Futures Law. She specializes in strategies to combat immigration, detention, enforcement, and criminalization. With over 20 years of experience, she has provided innovative legal and advocacy support to lawyers uh, and legal advocates, grassroots groups, organizers, and policy stakeholders fighting criminalization and immigration enforcement. Paromita, welcome. Thank you for having me today. I'm really excited to join you and these other amazing panelists. Thank you. So Baromita, uh, the criminal legal system is not the only system that depends heavily on data and information systems to target people like those that we've talked about today, gang databases, voice printing, um, risk assessment tools, the immigration system does as well. And perhaps even more so, corporations have been sharing wild amounts of personal information with Immigration and Customs Enforcement, also known as ICE, to help create target lists for detention and deportation. But Amita, can you help us uh, understand how this all works and how it impacts communities? Yes, absolutely. So um, technological surveillance, everything that we've heard today is transforming immigration enforcement and the way that it is transforming the criminal legal system. Um, as advocates have known for years, um, immigration enforcement and detention is big business for Silicon Valley. Um, and ICE, DHS, and many other agencies are selling, are basically spending billions and billions of dollars on procuring and maintaining these systems. And I think there's kind of these components of trying to understand what they're building, because this new government infrastructure around tech surveillance is one that collects information that analyzes information, that uses that information and stores it. And we, on the sad side of this all, you know, as many of us said, we don't know where it's going. We don't know much about it and how it's being stored and how it's being used. And it's being used um, and developed with private corporations. And so um, the way that we've been seeing ICE roll out kind of like this new tech surveillance strategy is in four ways. and. Um, it's working with your personal private information. And so there's the collectors, you know, we've seen ICE collect license plate information, right? That they would then put into uh, a bucket of information that they may use to create a list, right? Um, we do know that they collect very intimate biometric information, your face, your iris scan, your DNA. Um, they collect your voice print, your behavioral gate. Um, there's so many things that they collect and, you know, even one of our reports when we kind of received and looked at this data, we saw that even during the raid, they collect even more biometric information during the raid that they collect and store um, on you, namely your face, um, your GPS coordinates, right, and where you live. Um, then there's the data brokers, right? There's companies like Thomson Reuters and LexisNexis and Palantir that take all this information, sometimes utilities information, basic service information, um, and then they sell it amongst you know, state and federal government agencies. Um, then you need the analysts who read it. We see a lot of Booz Allen you know, in some of these kind of um, places where consultants are being used now to analyze this data. And then lastly, there's companies like Amazon and Microsoft, which have become the cloud storage brokers, right? They, they create the cloud space to hold millions and hundreds of millions of data, right, on all of us. And so all of this is being used to create a list. And the list then uh, will have people, not just about information about you, but about people who know you, who live next to you, um, and around you, 
And then that is what's really being kind of funneled into this immigration enforcement system. And so a really classic example is like this Mississippi raid that happened in 2019 in which 680 workers were arrested at a poultry plant. And what we found out after, I don't know if you remember, but there are these horrific pictures of children, you know, crying on the sidewalk as their family members, their mothers, their fathers, their aunts, their uncles were arrested. And what we found is that there, the women who were kind of like the genesis, like the seed for this enforcement action had been arrested at the border while coming in and were wearing ankle bracelets. And ICE used those GPS coordinates to really build out a picture of the 680 people that were there in that site. Um, and over the years, you know, instead of an ankle bracelet is typically used, right, to figure out whether you're going to be a flight risk or whether you're going to come back and attend your hearing. Um, in this case, it was actually used to generate like another raid. Um, and that's, I think, kind of a really crystal clear example of how they use GPS information and sting rays to kind of pull together to do a raid. Uh, I really appreciate that breakdown of the four categories. And I'm going to remember that the collectors, the brokers, the analyzers, and those that manage the cloud-based computing are uh, really, really important. Um, I also like, realized that it's not just undocumented people um, who you know, end up in these databases. As I understand it, this data sharing and labeling is actually used to disrupt organizing and criminalize protesters. Uh, can you say more about how exactly that happens um, and perhaps sharing another example. Yeah, so, um, you know, I'm part of a, a, a small legal shop and in our legal shop, we really believe that movement, inspired movement, right, requires very bold leaders and, and um, surveillance is nothing new for many activists and organizers, but what we know very well is that, you know, an attack on organizing is an attack on movement, right? And, uh, we see that as retaliation and we have seen DHS take direct action, you know, that can look like arrests, prosecutions, and just generally surveillance, right, against people who speak out against immigration enforcement policies um, and what they're doing. Um, and so even now, I think many of us saw DHS, you know, during the racial justice uprising, seeing how you know, Customs and Border Patrol deployed drones over Minneapolis, right? Or saw many of these federal agents. I mean, I think we were all shocked at the sheer kind of power and the military grade surveillance that these survey, you know, that DHS has. And um, that has like made us really nervous. Um, we know that they're monitoring communications, you know, either directly, you know, in prison, right? Or through things like social media sentiment analysis, which is basically monitoring social media to see what comes up, to vet people, you know, as they apply for visas, you know, when they come across the border, maybe it's figuring out what kind of politics you have, if you wanna come into the United States and speak on an issue. Um, but because we are really concerned about this, and we see this actually as a direct threat to democracy, and to like cherish democratic ideals, um, we brought some lawsuits and it was to challenge ISIS practice to systematically target and surveil and deport folks. And so when our client is La Resistencia, which is um, Maru, Maru Mora Villalpando is uh, the leader of La Resistencia. Resistencia. And uh, when she was leading, she's been doing this for a long time, years. And um, she has led um, many vigils outside the Tacoma Detention Center in Washington State. She has led, act, you know, protests. She has spoken out very clearly. She has spoken with people inside the facility. Um, and I think what was really chilling was to see this email that came out that said, you know, we we want to, you know, Marmor is the specific individual is behind the 2014 hunger strikes and every other one since then, she continually tries to foster hunger strikes and protests both inside and outside the facility. She is a self-proclaimed illegal alien. Um, and in fact, we have been planning on placing her, putting her into proceedings. And by placing her, I think it goes on to say later on, and this, this email is on our website, placing her into proceedings might actually take away some of her clout. And those kinds of direct threats, I think, are really chilling uh, for 
for I think should be chilling for everybody. Um, we've seen that, um, you know, happen with migrant justice in Vermont. We've seen it happen at the border um, with amazing activists who face extreme surveillance and prosecution and arrest by um, by DHS. And actually, The Intercept uh, documented at least 1,000 instances of retaliation against those speaking out. And I think that's why surveillance tech um, is a really critical part of how we think about solutions we want, you know, for, for us, you know, at this point when we're deploying all these kind of radical technologies without a public conversation about what it means. Yeah, incredible. I mean, as an advocate, I think that's something that's, that's, you know, deeply concerning um, above and beyond like for our communities as well. I mean, I think we've also seen throughout history, right, um, Black advocates been put on Black extremist lists or even the whole mm -hmm. practice of COINTELPRO, right, like once upon um, a time. And so you started to mention, right, that you're bringing litigation and lawsuits, and you actually just filed uh, a lawsuit last week um, against Clearview regarding their facial recognition, uh, which is yet another type of biometric data um, that, you know, we can talk about this evening. Can you tell us more about that lawsuit um, and why we should be concerned about facial recognition and what the solutions are? Yeah, so I think, you know, Clearview AI has built the most dangerous facial recognition database in the country. Um, it is, it allows law enforcement, government, and private companies to identify, uh, locate, and track people where they, where they go, who they are, you know, all by pressing a button on your mobile phone, right? And I think what it does is it allows us to be mapped, right, in a way that we have not experienced. Um, the people who brought this lawsuit, um, you know, because Clearview, this database, you know, is so powerful, you know, that it can identify people in public spaces, but it can also learn their professional roles, um, their religious affiliations, their familial connections, their friendships, their romantic partnerships you know, personal activities, political views, patterns of travel, home addresses, all those things, right, can go into a facial recognition database, right? That is the kind of powerful technologies that we have today. And so the activists who brought this lawsuit, um, there's four individual activists um, and two organizational ones. One is Mi Gente, which has been a leader in this space, shout out to them and their No Tech for ICE campaign. Um, and uh, also NorCal Resist. And they have all supported Black Lives Matter, criticized ICE and police reform um, uh, and or the police on online platforms. They've organized fundraisers. And I think, you know, what we felt is that it opened up to them up to retaliation, right? By ICE and the police um, and chilling the rights to protest is a threat to democracy. So we filed this lawsuit last week in California. You know, the goal is to um, really get California residents out of the database um, and to really stop Clearview, which has been frankly kind of made illegal in Canada. It's been questioned in most of Europe. Um, there's many law enforcement agencies that already are worried about Clearview and, and how it moves in some of these spaces. And so it seems like um, this was one place where we felt like there was a conversation. Um, and I think there, I think not only us, but I think advocates around the country need to have a conversation about these kind of very powerful tools around facial recognition technology. I think something that you just said there that was like so key, right? Which is that there are actually a lot of other nations that have already started banning this stuff, that it's not you know, a radical position to even take to suggest that like, we should not have facial recognition or we should be regulating this twist. Like it's just, you know, the lawless world of, of tech um, out here that is invading our privacy um, in many ways. Paramita, thank you so much to follow Paramita's work uh, at Just Futures Law, visit www.justfutureslaw.org and follow uh, them on Twitter at Just Futures Law. If you haven't yet, now's the time to drop your questions into the chats on YouTube and Facebook or on Twitter using the hashtag punishment profit. Uh, bear with us. We started a little late, so we're going to go a few minutes over. But before we jump into taking just a few Q&A questions, uh, here are my takeaways from this week's discussion about data and information systems in the prison industry. We often hear that data is neutral, but there really couldn't be anything further from the truth. 
For centuries, scientific data was used to suggest that certain races and ethnicities were inferior, uh, as we heard from Bernard. Time and time again throughout history, progress has been recognizing uh, that the data of the past was fraught with errors in the inputs and in the equations and consequently the outcomes. And it all starts with our hypotheses that inform how we collect data and design the analyses. Most important that these pieces come from us, biased humans. We're not going to calculate our way out of racism or xenophobia. Mandatory minimums, three strikes, and truth and sentencing laws all attempted to do that. They all instituted a false sense of formulaic justice that we're now trying to undo. And at the same time, we're reinventing those matrices as computer algorithms to perpetuate systems of racial violence, but that are further and further out of the public's view. We used to be able to see that matrices and we used to know how it added up to 20 years behind bars. We could do that math ourselves. But now innovation means that these formula, formulas are further and further out of our view. With corporations getting involved, this data is also now trading hands faster than it ever has. So whether it's gang databases that allow us to label entire communities, quote unquote criminal, or risk assessments that determine who deserves to be free and who doesn't, abolition doesn't call on us necessarily to remove discretion or in other words, the imperfections of humanity from the system, but rather it asks us to perhaps inject understanding and forgiveness into that discretion and to create systems that accommodate all of our uh, imperfections on all sides, those who are being judged by the systems, those who are doing the judging. But we must create a system that accommodates, that allows for that space, which means not rigid, outcomes. With that, let's bring back all of our guests to answer some of your questions. So um, we will take, unfortunately, just one or two questions uh, as it relates to, and we see them coming in. I'm looking down now, um, but just looking at the time, we will uh, try to grab a few. Um, some of these I think we actually did answer because they came in earlier, um, but I will uh, toss a few at our guests. Um, this one, maybe I will throw over to Paromita to quickly remind us from Dee Stevens, uh, do we know which technology vendors are providing the biometric uh, and sentiment analysis? There are so many. Um, you know, I would say that there's some big ones um, like Babel Street, you know, but there's a whole bunch of really small vendors. Um, I think like there's, uh, you know, we have seen a number of really small companies. We, we, we've been kind of diving deep into this um, through local projects that we have through a fellowship we run called Take Back Tech. And, and some of this has um, shown up, our contract analysis shown that there are dozens of companies, but some of the big ones would be like Babel Street. Let's say take a look at that one. Um, this next question is going to be, I'm going to throw this over to you, Debbie. Can you quickly let us know, of, uh, if you can recall, we won't hold you to recalling all 11, but which states you were able to confirm actually do uh, use voice printing right now in their present I, I do. I, yes, I do have that. I was a little worried oh, about Oh, Debbie's going to give you the full answer, folks. I was worried about time constraints, so I didn't name them, but I'll say them now. <laughs> New York. Florida, Texas, Connecticut, I'm reading, so I'm not looking at the screen. Um, Connecticut, Georgia, Arizona, New Mexico, Michigan, Massachusetts, Colorado, and Wisconsin. Thank you so much. Um, this one uh, for Bernard, if I could, the question is from Allison. Um, can you give a quick example of a risk assessment tool? I think folks uh, may not all be really familiar with that language. Oh, sure. Yeah, right. Of course. So, um, you know, so the LSIR level of services inventory revised or compass uh, are risk assessment tools, but um, here, here, here basically, and here's an example, say, 
in, uh, in Virginia in uh, sentencing, uh, some of the offenses, like a sexual offense, for instance, is going to be sentenced with a, with a tool that basically will decide your risk level. And based on that risk level, it will kind of increase 100% or 200% or 300%, create kind of greater sentences or lower sentences, for instance. A tool like that uses, uh, for instance, your age. So if you're under you know, 25, you get a certain number of points, you get more points uh, than if you're older. It'll use the fact that you dropped out of school uh, in uh, ninth grade, say. Any, any education, if you have education higher than ninth grade, then you get lower points, right? So, so and what you wanna have is lower points. Um, if you're regularly unemployed, it'll give you more points. Um, prior criminal history, it's just full of um, different things like, you know, have you been arrested before? Have you ever been detained before or incarcerated before? And those things as well will give you more points. And basically that's the way these risk tools work. Um, it's, uh, it's, you know, a, a numbers uh, game where they give you more points and you are higher, you'll end up in a higher risk category if you have those qualifications like younger age, uh, less education, uh, lots of criminal contacts. And of course, it, it really, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize how that's gonna play out in terms of uh, predictions and the effects on and the racial disparities. And Thank you, uh, Bernard. Yeah, and I, you know, I just want to say that I think those particular pieces, right, like that is deciding, right, whether or not you can get out on bail, um, whether you like you're deserving enough to get out on bail, or whether your sentence should be um, increased in those different pieces, and um, and a lot of those. I mean, even the arrest factors, right, for those at home who may not understand, like may not be familiar with all this language. An arrest doesn't mean a conviction. It just means you were arrested. That case could be entirely dismissed. It's still on your record and still would increase um, for the next time that you're um, uh, you know, facing uh, those charges. So understanding that. Um, okay, the last um, question, I'll pop over back to Baromita. I'm gonna combine two, one from Dreis and one from Chris. Uh, and the question, oh, excuse me, from Jennifer uh, Terry. Um, Questions are about data again. Um, and the question in particular are two types of data and whether or not you've seen these funneled into ICE or other type of um, law enforcement. So specifically are um, school K through 12 or higher ed records funneled into this uh, infrastructure of surveillance. And um, as Chris says, I recently checked my Google activity and was shocked to see that Google has everywhere that I've been. Um, the path I took to get there and how long I was there. Um, is this something that DHS is able to get? Yeah, so um, I think for the first question about K through 12, I haven't seen anything yet that suggests that school information is going on. However, I think what Yosmar said before around gang databases, I think there is a pipeline, right? When it comes to criminal information that you collect, you know, through a school resource officer, right? That makes its way to ICE. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily about school, but always about policing um, that makes its way across agencies, state, local, federal. Um, with regard to the second question on um, Google, absolutely, right? A lot of what Clearview does, it has, you know, Clearview got its data by through scraping. And what that means is it goes to a public sites and it scrapes your data over what it can find. So whatever you have that's publicly available um, can be um, can be seen um, like Clearview's AI's database has 3 billion images in it, right? And so those 3 billion uh, images came from Facebook, right? Came from Google, um, et cetera. But I think if you look also at um, Google, they do get subpoenas, right? And um, Google often gets subpoenas and this was kind of tackled um, in different ways, not, not directly, but 
how uh, federal agencies respond to subpoenas for your personal information is something that I think will become a bigger and bigger issue for uh, agencies like DHS and for police, right, as they seek your footprints across the internet, right? Um, and that is definitely something that we should all be aware of, that, you know, how, uh, how these companies respond to requests for information about your data um, is something that we know very little about. Um, and uh, that information, of course, can be shared with police because, you know, it's not clear, you know, in some ways, like if they need a warrant or not and for what. Thank you so much, Paramita. I'm going to give you 30 seconds, Bernard, if you can answer this one last question. It's a little test <laughs> um, that somebody came in, which is, is it possible to litigate in order to shine a light on these the algorithms behind those risk assessment tests um, that are protected by corporations, um, or do they have some type of immunity? Mm. So corporations wouldn't have immunity. Uh, it's um... It's states and counties that have that kind of immunity and kind of the qualified immunity that we've gotten used to in the policing context. Uh, so uh, the lawsuits, I mean, there have been lawsuits, there have been attempts, there have been situations in, in defending a case where individuals have tried to get the information and haven't been able so far to get it. Um, but um, it's more just a question of uh, kind of inadequate you know, due process rights, really, uh, than it is a question of immunity, I would say. Thank you so much. Um, yes, and I think, you know, that I, it also just sort of lent to that, which is this idea that they are proprietary trade secrets, right, is in large part just like the failure of capitalism to protect us. Um, that, you know, forget what it does to our communities. Um, it is more important that we protect the competitive interest, business interests of corporations. So with that, that's all we have time for today. And I wanna thank our guests so much for joining us tonight. Joe Smar, who filled in for Taylan, uh, Bernard, Debbie, and Baromita. Uh, and thank you to all of you at home for joining us uh, and bearing with us through some technical difficulties today. We'll be back next week at the same time, Tuesday at 7 p.m. to talk about telecom. For those who want to keep tonight's conversation going, to ask more questions or share your reflections, join me and some of our speakers as we head over to Clubhouse. Uh, we will be back in Clubhouse. We had a little bit of a gaffe on Twitter spaces um, last week. I don't think they're ready for us. Um, just follow me at Bianca Tylek to find the room. Uh, and if you'd like to learn more uh, about our work or support our work at Worth Rises, please check us out at worthrises.org and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Worth Rises. I'm Bianca Tyler. Good night.